We now interrupt this regularly scheduled program with a word from the great exalted leader, General Secretary of the Chinese Communist Party, Xi Jinping. Attention, weak Western capitalist dogs of America. For too long, Hollywood superhero movie propaganda have insulted most honorable Chinese state and have insulted Chinese Communist Party very much with propaganda such as flag-bearing symbols of freedom and war-mongering industrialists. Your MCU propaganda films will no longer be permitted to poison minds of most well-treated and grateful subject er, citizens of most honorable Chinese motherland, much like LeBron James of NBA, all Disney MCU writers, directors, actors must report immediately to re-education camps for brainwash or reprogramming proper movie etiquette as not to offend most honorable Communist Party of China. If wish for release of MCU movie in China in future, one must fall in line like most honorable Greek Chinese hero, John Cena. That is all. You just got pwned, pwned. Pwned, pwned. Got pwned, pwned. Blah, 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 blah. You just got old. Got pwned. Pwned. Got pwned. You just got pwned. Hey, welcome back to the channel. My name is Dave. Online, I go by Count Shakula. Welcome to a new episode of When Comic Books Didn't Suck. This is the show where I talk about comic books, comic book movies, past, present, future, uh, the good, the bad, the ridiculous. Unfortunately, um, it pains me that the majority of the new stuff is in the ridiculous and the downright awful maybe i should include that label as well but uh like i said welcome back this is my second episode um got a few things to talk about we're going to be going over another current comic book new release comic book <laughs> oh boy uh today um on the show and i've got a few topics that were kind of interesting to me um, that I want to talk about. So let's get right into it here. Um, let me bring up my topics here. First, uh, first topic is going to be regarding, uh, something that I covered, um, last episode of, and you know, it, it got a lot of media hype, media attention. And I think, I think that was kind of on purpose. And I think that was what the writer had intended. Yes, I'm going to be going over the uh, uh, another little thing that popped up about the pregnant Joker story. And this is from CBR. I, I hate referencing CBR.com. It's pretty trashy every once in a while. It's not very balanced at all. They, uh, they lean, they are pretty, uh, they, they lean to the woke side, if you will, uh, more so, you know, kind of defend the, they're more so the defenders and the gatekeepers of this new crap that's uh, that's happening in the comic book industry, um, which you know uh, there's there's a lot of news I'm not going to cover. I, I might end up covering next episode regarding uh, some of the stuff going on with the comicsology 
the Amazon layoffs. I mean, I know a lot of big companies are laying off right now. Um, you know, pretty pretty scary times. You know, according to Biden, oh no, it's the the economy's better than it's ever been, and all of this. But uh, unfortunately, I don't think the uh, the current condition of the North American comic book industry is in such great shape as they've all claiming that everything's fine. Um, yeah, everything's fine. Maybe if um, if you make uh, Japanese comic books, uh, manga comic books, uh, seems like everything is on the up and up. But um, I mean, you know, maybe that's the reason why they're uh, they're being real uh, secretive on the sales charts. You don't see those sales charts much anymore. Um, they they kind of keep that on the down low. But anyway, a uh, pregnant Joker story writer addresses media and fan backlash. Um, writer Matthew Rosenberg addresses the controversy surrounding the pregnant Joker story featured in the DCU's The Joker, The Man Who Stopped Laughing, number four. It's a comic book I went over uh, last episode. Uh, complete garbage. Uh, complete nonsense. But, you know, it, I didn't really equate that to him trying to make some sort of statement regarding, like, a men can get pregnant or anything like that it says matthew rosenberg addresses the responses and reactions to his pregnant joker story a non-canical um backup tale featured in dc's the joker the man who stopped laughing i knew that wasn't i knew that wasn't canon um it doesn't matter to me it's still it, it's still kind of shines a light on the current state of the editorial process that's going on in comic books. It's garbage. They are, they actually charged extra. They're charging a dollar extra for those comic books. And they're having a slapping some little stupid seven, eight page story on the end of the, of the main story. And they're charging you extra. And it's like the art is horrible. Uh, I mean, look at this. It, it, this pa this is passing for comic book art. I don't care if it's a little side short story. I mean, the little hostess ads in the '70s uh, were drawn better. You know, featuring the com Marvel comic book characters were drawn better than this garbage. But my point is that it's just terrible writing. I mean, the the main story was terrible as well. But he wants to kind of clarify, and it, I guess it appeared on Fox News, okay? They had a little segment on Fox News, and of course he's crying that Fox News, Matthew Brosenberg is crying that Fox News is attacking his work and all this stuff. Whatever. Yeah, it, it's another, another case of a current Marvel writer that you just have to scratch your head and say, how in the hell did this guy get work? How in the hell is this guy in the comic book industry? I've read, I kind of went back and read some more of his stuff. Um, yeah, it, it all fits in line with this crappy Joker stuff. So it says, you know, let, let's pick it up here. The Joker, the man who stopped laughing, features a backup story, knocked upside down. Uh, Matthew Rosenberg, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, shortly after following madly in love with Zaytana, knocked upside down, sees the clown prince of crime become pregnant with a pile of muddy vomits out. We went through all of that. If you haven't, if you don't know what it, what's going on, um, I mean, it's all over YouTube, but if you don't know what's going on, you can catch what I talked about in my previous episode. Um, eventually, the joke, it, it says, see, the turns into a mini, mini sized doppelganger of himself. The Joker eventually declares as his son. He vomits this mud. I guess Zatanna puts the spell on him. Okay, we've already covered that. Uh, but it became quickly became controversial as many reacted, complained about, including uh, Fox News's Joe Concha, who admitted he doesn't know or care about the story's context when speaking about the matter on the air, or defended the entry when discussing it online. Um, and and uh, what had, what Matthew Rosenberg had posted was, I should probably explain to those who aren't reading the book, but also shame on you. It's fun, fun. I, okay, I had no fun. I actually, yeah, I admit it. I purchased the book off of Comixology to, to read it because I was, I was interested. I, I was a sucker. I fell for the, I fell for the bait, the outrage bait. But I, you know, I wanted to do it to review it for myself. I had to see this stuff for myself. There's nothing fun about it. Okay, it's absolutely embarrassing. Uh, once again, like I said last episode, if Jim Shooter was in charge over there at DC. 
that would have never reached the printer. He would have laughed the guy out of the office. He would have booted his, he would have taken his uh, size 15 boot. I mean, the guy, Jim Shooter, the guy is like 6'8", and just booted the dude right out of the freaking office, okay? I mean, give me a break, man. The backup stories by myself with the brilliant Francesco Francis Vela on art. Brilliant. Did you see that art? Ah, can't believe that even passes as comic book art. Are made to be sort of a silver age fever dream of the Joker and explore different non, uh, non-canical explanations of how there could be multiple Jokers and other themes of the main book. So far, he's accidentally cloned himself in a magic mirror, faked his own death, so he could see what other people say at his funeral. I'm not sure what any of this has to do with the Silver Age Joker. Um, yeah, I, I just don't see. That's just such a such a lame excuse. It's just horrible writing, okay? But it, you know, they are literally silly gag strips. You're you're charging extra dollar for this, okay? So. Uh, yeah, Matthew Rosenberg is a definite, uh, indicator of one of the problems with the current comic book industry of the, the kind of people that they're hiring to write this stuff. I mean, guys like Dan Slott are bad enough. I mean, um, speaking of Dan Slott, I think I'll go over, uh, something Dan Slott had recently said, hopefully I'm pulling up the right thing here. Uh, another, uh, now, Dan Slott's been around uh, writing comic books longer than Matthew Rosenberg. But uh, Dan Slott says anyone saying that the She-Hulk official TV show wasn't comic book accurate, I'm the guy who has written more issues of She-Hulk than anyone. I've read every single comic from every She-Hulk run. Oh, so have I, Dan. I've been reading comic books for 45 years. I bought the original She-Hulk off the spinner rack in 1979. Uh, I have all of the John Byrne run from 1988 to, you know, that the run of sensational She-Hulk. Um, and unfortunately (laughs) I have, um, I've read your run of She-Hulk as well. And I'm saying for the record, it is the most comic book accurate show in the MCU. He's always, I mean, Dan Slott's a guy online that says he doesn't want controversy, says he doesn't want to respond to all the, the Twitter trolls and all of that, but he's always making some sort of claim he's all you know so dan slot has written more issues than she hulk it's quantity over quality so somehow that gives him the that gives him the uh the status to say what is more comic book accurate um and the, and the point of the she hulk disney show it, it who cares if it's comic book accurate yeah um they dived in, in on the show. I didn't watch all the episodes because I, I gave up. I was hopeful after episode one of She-Hulk. I gave up after three episodes. I was like, this is just more horseshit writing. Um, once again, they put somebody in charge of a Marvel property that shouldn't be anywhere near the comic book industry or any any media that has anything to do with comic books it's just some other some new feminist woman i i don't know what her credentials were or what she did in the past but that doesn't necessarily equate to being able to write entertaining quality stories from the marvel properties created by actual talented people uh stan lee created she hulk you know, he he thought that, you know, and John Buscema was the, they had John Buscema as the original artist on, on She-Hulk as well. Um, and, you know, you're talking about, you're talking about comic book legends, and you're going to put that in the hands of some woman that's never, doesn't know anything about She-Hulk, has never, doesn't care about the old, you know, care about um, withholding, you know, upholding the uh, the classic stories of She-Hulk or anything like that. It's just something, some box she checked to further her career, that a career she probably shouldn't even have, okay? I mean, stick to stick to whatever you write, like uh, romance, 
whatever horse shit feminist romance stuff, you know, between two lesbians or whatever the whatever the stuff that you're known for. I have no idea. I don't even know the lady's name. It's not even important to me. But um, who cares if She Hulk is somewhat comic book accurate? If the comic, if the they decide to take that accuracy from a shit run, which Dan Slott's She Hulk run is shit. It's utter shit. And I'm going to, I'll probably showcase it on this show at one point. We'll, we'll probably, I'll probably end up showing one of the issues if you don't believe me. Now, now some of the, the newer generation of comic book readers saying he's the greatest thing ever. And I'm like, not from what I'm comparing, I, I'm, I'm making the comparison to the, to the John Byrne um, sensational She-Hulk run from the late 80s. It doesn't even hold up. That's, that's what they should have went for. They should have went for that instead of, uh, you know, She-Hulk at the bar and she's drinking and then she turns back into Jennifer Walters. Oh, no, I can't, I can't handle alcohol. They had a scene like that. Uh, in, Dan Slott had put a panel like that in the comic book. And, yeah, I guess he was flattered that they decided to put that garbage into the, the, the She-Hulk Disney Plus streaming show. So to him, that's the version of comic book accuracy. But, you know, his version of being accurate to the comic book, but it doesn't matter, Dan, but let, let, let's just look at what we're talking about with Dan Slott. I found another tweet that he recently posted, and this will kind of give you a uh, look into just the mindset of these people that they're hiring to write these books. Um, uh, you know, this is a couple of weeks. This is from January 6th. And I saw this on Dan Slott's Twitter. And it, I, I just had to, I, I couldn't believe somebody would even post this. But uh, the the question that was posed on, on Twitter here um, by somebody, uh, what what's a film you walked out of? Okay, and I, I was, I'm thinking, um, there's a, quite a few films. I don't go to the theater much anymore. Uh, cause the quality of the, the movies are just shit anymore. And uh, majority of the movies are just shit anymore. Um, not worth my 20 minute drive that I need to take to go to the theater and you know, the, the, the eventual 20, $25 I'm going to drop, you know, maybe get some popcorn and a pop or whatever, you know, get a drink and, uh, you know, sit there and just, uh, be disappointed time and time again. Now there's a few exceptions. Spider-Man no way home was enjoyable. Um, but you know, I'd rather watch it in the privacy of my own home. You know, I don't have little brat kids running around the theater screaming and, you know, which actually happened when I went to see Spider-Man No Way Home. But, uh, I mean, there's plenty of films I would have, I, I thought about walking out of, um, just because not anything that offended me because I, I'm not built that way. I, I like to be offended. I like to see offensive things. I like offensive comedians. I like offensive movies. Uh, I like offensive music. It's just, I, that's the way I grew up. I, I don't like censorship and I really hate self-censorship. Um, that's the worst kind of censorship is self-censorship. You know, somebody else decides to censor something, that's kind of out of your control. But the self-censorship um, is something that just, oh man, it just irks me. And uh, it's just not the way we grew up. We we grew up trying to, um, you know, where I grew up, we we were constantly looking for offensive material. It was it was great. You know, you had the old classic comedians. Uh, you know, Lenny Bruce, George Carlin, Richard Pryor. You know, early Eddie Murphy. Nothing pains me more to see like a, a raw comedian, and then you. And then you see him and it's like you're looking at, you're staring in the eyes of some neutered puppy dog now. You know, he's walking on eggshells and scared to say anything. I mean, that is so, I mean, that is so spirit breaking, man. That, that's just so sad. I, I, I just hate to see it. I'm getting off the topic a little bit. Let's, let's get back on why I'm on Dan Slot's Twitter in the first place. But, uh, you know, what's a film you walked out of? And Dan Slot replies, I couldn't believe it, man. And, and he's probably so, he was probably so proud of this. First movie I ever walked out was National Lampoon's Vacation. 
It was the joke about the dog being dragged to death behind the car. I couldn't believe people were cracking up at that. I didn't want to be around them. I eventually saw the rest of the movie on cable. This is the kind of people, and you know, Dan Slott's being pretty sure he's being dead serious about this. This is the kind of people that they're hiring to write comic books. This guy shouldn't be anywhere near the comic book industry. Uh, I don't know. I mean, he couldn't be a Walmart greeter because he'd probably be offended by somebody's T-shirt that came in. You know, if somebody walks in Walmart, he'd probably, oh, oh, sir, I can't believe, I can't believe that you're wearing this T-shirt with the American flag on it or something. I mean, this is exactly the kind of person that they're hiring to write these comic books. What kind of ridiculous buffoon says that they walked out of National Lampoon's vacation? Now, I almost walked out of um, uh, Star Wars, uh, whatever, The Phantom Menace. I almost walked out because I was so disappointed in the movie. You know, uh, the Godzilla movie with Matthew Broderick. I had been waiting for that movie for the longest time. I, you know, and I got, I got, I got reeled right in, reeled me in, sucker, hooked me in the mouth, and I sat there. I li- I put down my cash and I sat there. And halfway through the movie, it was like this is just utter dog shit. I mean, unbelievable. But can you believe? Somebody would post that he walked out of National Lampoon's vacation. What did, what did that come out in 1983? I saw it in the theater multiple times, me and my friends, you know, in I think it was the summer of 83. Might have been 84. I can't remember. Could have been even 82. I know it was early 80s. Can't remember the exact. That was, I mean, that's, that's like a universally loved movie. How, that was so funny. I mean, they strapped the gra- the dead grandmother up on top of the station wagon. <laughs> They're going cross country, and then they hold the you know Wally World's closed, and they hold John Candy at gunpoint. The guard. I mean, that movie Chevy Chase star was already rising, but that movie kind of put him like really on the map. And of course, you got introduced to Christy Brinkley, you know, in the red Ferrari and everything like that. She became a household name. This isn't a show about National Lampoon's Vacation, but you get my point. But, but uh, Dan, that's the thing that did it because they, they didn't actually hurt the dog, Dan. It's a fucking joke, you... Oh, my God. Insufferable moron. And, and they've got this guy writing comic books, man. And not only... Like, he's a heralded... Oh, he posted on his bio... He's the New York Times best-selling Eisner-winning comic book writer. Uh, you're, you're kidding me, you know. And he's known—he's known for writing Spider-Man. Um, get out of here, man! Quit hiring these buffoons, man. I know it's way too late, you know. In Dan Slott's case, he's been writing comic books for decades now. But I mean, this is the kind of this is the kind of crap. But you know, you've got guys. You've got legends of the industry as well, guys like Jerry Conway who have become woke all of a sudden because they fall into this cultural nonsense. And now, you know, we're talking about the guy that created the Punisher for crying out loud. And now he's tweeting virtue, virtuous stuff like, uh, you know, he's the Punisher shouldn't should be way more PC. You created the freaking character. Are you kidding me? Anyway, that's my little rant about some of the newer comic book writers. Uh, I couldn't believe I read that that tweet. And that was just something recent from Dan. So, uh, let, you know, let me know in the comments if you end up watching the video or listen to the show on Spotify. Let me know, uh, you know, get on my YouTube channel. Let me know if I'm way off base on this or this is just ridiculous as it sounds that you cannot believe that somebody would post this. And this is a guy writing comic books currently for Marvel comic books, no less. I mean, it's, I, I just can't, I can't wrap my head around it. So anyway, let's, uh, let's get on to the next topic. Enough about that idiot Dan Slott. Um, something I saw here on bounding into comic books, uh, bounding into comics, uh, online publication, really good, really good, uh, online publication here. Um, is a report from January 18th and it really doesn't come to any surprise, but, and I was, I was a little, I was a little surprised to even see that 
this would be like a current topic headline because they've been talking about this kind of stuff um, for a few years now, uh, especially when it relates to like uh, NBA athletics, you know, LeBron James and his uh, all those memes that they had uh, regarding, you know, bowing to communist China, the NBA, like kind of telling the telling their players to uh, to be careful what you say. You know, you can say anything you want to offend American citizens. Who cares about that? You know, you have freedom of speech, but um, let's not, you know, let's walk on eggshells and let's be careful what we say because our product, you know, we, our, our product goes over pretty well in, uh, in China talking about, uh, you know, uh, professional basketball. But uh, the rep- this says report the Walt Disney Company and Marvel Studios to educate actors in order to placate communist China. Now, that, what a funny, what a funny headline there. In order to uh, placate comedy, I mean, that's that's actually. Now, if this would have showed up on CBR, they would have spun that headline. You know, uh, somehow they would have more, more times than not, depending on who's writing it. I guess this is by John Trent. I don't know who that is, but um, yeah, Walt. Co- Walt Disney Company and Marvel Studios. I like how they throw the Marvel Studios in there to educate actors in order to placate communist China. Um, A new report claims that Walt Disney Company and Marvel Studios will begin educating their actors and executives in order to placate communist China to ensure the release of future films in the country. The report comes from the Hollywood reporters Kim Master and Alex Weeprin as they covered an investor battle inside the Walt Disney Company pitting current CEO Bob Iger against former Marvel executive Ike Perlmutter and hedge fund manager Nelson Peltz, who wants a seat on the Disney board. So, yeah, it's all about money. Um, At the end of the day, it's all about money. And I can understand this from a business aspect side of it. But there's kind of a flip side to the coin. And, it, you know, it goes back to the censorship issue, of course, but there's more than that. Um, it says amid the, the report, Masters and Weeprin claim the future Marvel films will not feature any Chinese villains. Um, well, they already screwed up the Mandarin, right? I mean, you can't... It, it's almost like they had a had like a, a producer's meeting, you know, with the director and the writer uh, when it comes to the those Iron Man movies that were kind of leading into the Mandarin and they said, you know, how can we take, because the Mandarin is basically Iron Man's Dr. Doom in the comic books. Okay. He's always been Iron Man's number one villain all throughout the sixties. Now he's had some other ones, Crimson Dynamo, Titanium Man, you know, Unicorn Melter, all those guys. But the, the big head honcho villain, the Dr. Doom of Iron Man was always the Mandarin. Um, and and he's kind of a main villain in the in the Marvel universe. And he yeah, he happens to be Chinese. Okay. Okay. And yeah, maybe in the sixties they depicted it more of a stereotypical uh you know, stereotypical, you know, Chinese villain kind of a, you know, a character of of like what a Chinese villain might be that in the minds of Americans or something like that. I don't know. It Anyway, they screwed it. They screwed up the Mandarin terribly. I mean, it, that's obvious. They made it. I, I, I'm not going to go into the big, uh, the big deal of what they, how bad they screwed it up or anything like that. But I mean, just watch the movies. It was, it was horrible because I was looking forward to maybe seeing Iron Man battle the Mandarin. It never going to happen, and especially not now since you, you know, you have to walk on eggshells. Marvel films will not feature any Chinese villains. But that the talent, and they quote here, the talent will be well schooled to watch their words. <laughs> Don't mention the T word, Taiwan. Don't mention that. Don't mention, you know, George Carlin had the George Carlin had the seven of what was it? The seven the seven words can't say on television or whatever, you know. I can't remember exactly the skit. Uh, I think it was from his Carnegie Hall, his legendary Carnegie Hall stand up bit. But um I remember watching it on HBO in the early 80s and just loving it, laughing my ass off. Uh, 
now they're going to have the seven words that uh, MCU actors can't, <laughs> MCU writers and actors can't uh, speak in a uh, in a Mar in a you know Marvel a Disney MCU uh, movie. That would be hilarious. Might have to come up with those seven words. I know Liberty would be one of them. Um, here, it, related story here on this uh, on this page. Report, China wanted to remove the Statue of Liberty from Spider-Man No Way Home. Sony refused. Uh, oh, you, you, <laughs> you, you, uh, you CGI over Statue of Liberty. Yeah, I, I can see it now. Um, did, did Sony really refuse? I mean, Sony might have refused to do it on their end, but I'm not sure if, I'm sure China alters the movies anyway. I don't know how that works with, China, I think, you know, a year goes by and then China eventually gets the movies and they probably edit the crap out of them. They censor the crap out of them. Um, you know, they they probably would CGI in some <laughs> CGI, some big image of some, you know, Chinese dictator uh, over the Statue of Liberty or something. I don't know what goes on, but uh, China refused. Oh, yeah, sure they did. Yeah. Um, but it says, uh, the report comes after the Walt Disney's official Chinese social media accounts announced that Black Panther, Wakanda forever and anti-man, they made a typo there, Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania secured theatrical releases in China. Um, I wonder if they're going to change, uh, Kang. Cause I think, I think in the, um, in the comic books, classically Kang even though he's a, you know, he's from the future, you know, he's from thousands of years in the future. Uh, it's kind of, it's, I forget what word I'm looking for here. Uh, it, it, it's kind of a subtle hint that he is like Asian warlord. Uh, he comes from Asian warlord heritage, you know, Kang. Maybe I'm off base. I don't know. Um, I'm just, I'm just assuming there. I, I always, whenever I saw the, you know, whenever I heard the, the super villain, you know, the super villain named Kang, I always thought of like an Asian villain, but uh, he isn't really depicted that way in the comic books, but I'm kind of curious how that's going to go over uh, with the Chinese government. Oh, they, he must be named future man, not Kang. That make, that make China, Maybe that villainous Chinese man. Um, who knows? Who knows? But uh, I thought that was kind of an interesting little uh, sad, really, because, you know, why don't they just give the middle finger to China? Uh, cut the budgets. I mean, it's money you're worried about. Cut the budgets. Quit paying these actors ridiculous sums of money. Uh, make lower budget movies and actually get back to making quality movies you don't need to have bigger isn't necessarily better budget wise you can tell stories um you can you can tell good stories look at the uh perfect example look at the the carl urban dread movie that didn't have a big budget okay that wasn't that doesn't have any like big time actors in it um carl urban isn't like a household name big time you know, big money actor. Um, but that was a great movie. And I'm sure the budget was a lot less than the 1995 Sylvester Stallone movie. Uh, I could be wrong about that. Stallone's fee for appearing in that movie probably was half of the budget of the damn Carl Urban movie. I don't know. I'm speculating, but uh, I'd have to look that all that up. But which one's better? The, the Carl Urban Dread movie is way better. It's 20 times better than the Judge Dredd movie. Now, the Judge Dredd movie, you know, I kind of watch it because it's bad. You know, anytime I rewatch it and, you know, I enjoy it every once in a while just because I like to make fun of it. I like to mock it, you know. Um, but it's not a good Judge Dredd movie. But the, the Carl Urban Judge Dredd movie was. And the budget was so much lower. I mean, they've got to get back to... They've got to get back to quality 
instead of the big this big spending millions of dollars or hundreds of millions of dollars on making these movies i mean look at star wars for crying out loud that didn't have a big budget originally that's one of the greatest movies ever made in my opinion you know so but uh but yeah i thought that was kind of interesting and speaking of uh speaking of big budget versus uh little budget movies i've got i've got one other thing here before i get to the comic book that i'm going to be looking at um uh, on this episode i there was another uh another kind of uh, article that caught my attention here i knew nothing about this uh from bounding into comics again um this is from january 19th by the same guy john john trent uh director john carpenter claims he's not involved with escape from new york reboot says last he heard they were gender swapping snake uh i have a i've got a lot of problems with this um okay let's let's say uh now, this is, these are all rhetorical questions I'm about to ask here, okay? Rhetorical questions. I'm no dummy. I know why they're remaking Escape from New York, because they're creatively bankrupt. Uh, they have, they're, they're out of ideas. Um, they're not hiring people. They're not hiring creative people anymore. And, you know, what, what can we remake to try to cash in? It's a cash grab, okay? Um, it's, a, it's a latch on to nostalgia cash grab. And, but why are they remaking Escape from New York? Re- all rhetorical. I understand. I understand. Um, I understand the reason, but some things they shouldn't touch. Escape from New York, uh, if you don't know, is a movie that came out in the early 80s with um, Kurt Russell. But it was it was a low-budget movie. John, That's kind of John Carpenter's, um, that's kind of his, uh, his forte is... You know, the lower the budget, the better he. it seems like he makes the movie. And they really need to get back to that. But Escape from New York was a perfect example. Uh, didn't seem to be like a huge budget movie. Didn't have any huge stars in it. Kurt Russell, Kurt Russell wasn't a huge star at the time. He was an upcoming, he was one of the upcoming stars. But he wasn't, Kurt Russell wasn't like a household name. And I think it came out in 1982. What a great year for movies, by the way, 1982. All those those early 80s, some of the greatest movies ever. But Escape from New York's just got that, it's just got that charm to it. Um, you know, I, I like to rewatch it every, you know, every once in a while. And I, it, I just have to compare it to some of the big blockbuster, the big CGI movies. You don't need all this big CGI crap, you know, uh, Perfect example of these new Godzilla movies. Oh, look how good Godzilla looks. But the story is shit, okay? The movie is shit. I don't care how good Godzilla... I would trade Godzilla not looking near as good for an actual quality story. And, uh, you know, now Escape from L.A., eh, okay. I, I'm not going to go out on a limb to defend that one too much. That was a little bit of a... It seemed a little bit of a forced, unnecessary sequel. But Escape from New York is just one of those classics. Um, it's just minimal m- movie making, much like he did, much like John Carpenter did with Halloween, um, the original Halloween, which is so good. I mean, so low budget, so scary. It's still scary. I mean, I don't get scared easy, you know, rewatching those horror movies, but it scared the crap out of me when I saw that in the theater when I was like a, I think I was a, I think I was nine years old and I went with my sister. And I couldn't sleep for months after that movie. I mean, it was so good. And it didn't have any, you know, there's no CGI, low budget, no name actors. That's fine. As long as the story the, it, and the, the movie is put together well. And John Carpenter was a master at that. Um, but let, now let's get into the gender swapping snake. I mean, that doesn't surprise me at all. But that's, this, this movie's dead. They, this isn't going to go over. They're going to they're gonna roast this movie. Uh, all of these gender swap movies, the the I won't say all, but the vast majority of these gender swap movies, they don't. It's almost like they're trolling people now. It's like we dare you to be outraged, so we can blame it on toxic masculinity. Blah blah. You got you know. You did it. They did it with Ghostbusters, and they've they're doing it with what? Oh, they did it with Ocean's Eleven, and that flopped. And they do it with this and that anymore. 
gender swapping snake. When are they going to learn that this crap doesn't work? Okay. The movie public, the movie going public, even in 2023, they're not having this stuff. Okay. They're not having it. So watch the original, um, you know, let me know in the comments. If you think escape from New York sucked. I, I've talked to some younger people that, that think it's all right, but they don't think it's that great. I mean, I guess you have to base it on your perspective of the time periods. Uh, in the early 80s, it was like they played it on HBO all the time. One of the, To me, it was one of the greatest movies ever. I just, I love it. I love to rewatch it to this day, you know, call me Snake. You know, it, and they're going to do some kind of joke play on all of the, all of the Snake Liskin's catchphrases, but they're going to do it in a female they're going to have a female spin on it if they actually do end up gender swapping uh, Kurt Russell's role of Snake Plissken. Just an iconic role, classic. Um, I just can't believe they're going to do that. I mean, this is this is one that I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to, um, I'm going to have to see it to believe it. So, so anyway, let's. Uh, I'm going to get on to my last little segment here. Um, Enough about Hollywood, enough about movies. We're going to get into a comic book here. Uh, <laughs> okay. And one of my favorite comic book, probably one of the most beloved comic book characters that's been created um, in the last, what, what would you say, 40, Deadpool was created, what, in late 80s? Um, so in the last, uh, last 30 some odd years, Deadpool, hands down, is one of the most um, beloved, newer creation comic books, uh, comic book characters, I should say. Um, there isn't really any newer character today that can compare to the popularity that's been capitalized on um, by Deadpool. Um, Deadpool, of course, created by Rob Liefeld back in, um, I believe it was 1989. And... Um, you really can't, I mean, name a character, name a character from besides maybe the walking, some of the walking dead characters, but that's an independent comic book. Um, name, name a character from like Marvel or DC, a current character that's gone over like Deadpool, even close, um, you know, in the last 20 years, you can't do it. Miles Morales. No, nope. Sorry. That was forced on people. Um, just a cheap knockoff. Uh, you know, Deadpool was kind of a... Some people say Deadpool was a knockoff of Deathstroke and all this. And it was kind of a parody. You know, it was you know, the, it was made to be a parody. But it was still a, a serious character that was centered in the Marvel Universe. Now they've made Deadpool a parody of a parody. Uh, and it's all with these crap, shit, current comic book writers. Deadpool's newest love interest is a major step forward in queer representation, of course, from CBR.com by Sophie Foggia or whatever. Uh, this is published two days ago. No one cares about queer representation in comic books. The real comic book consumers don't give two shits about your queer representation. When are you going to get that through your thick head? These things do not sell. The comic the 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 true comic book collectors, the comic book enthusiasts that that go out to the comic book stores, actually, you know, go in the go to the brick and mortar stores and buy this stuff or, you know, if they buy it digitally, these aren't the things that's going over. You're killing, you're killing mainstream comic books in North America by allowing this crap to be published. Editors, I'm talking to you. I know you've got to be down. I know your hands are tied and you've got to be down with this, this cultural fad of queer representation and the alphabet mafia crap, uh, you know, that's trying to hold everyone else's view of reality hostage, basically. But um, it's crazy. I mean, this is just absolute crazy. And I'm actually, yes, I'm actually going to show this comic book. 
Um, please do not send any hate mail my way. I am so sorry, but I have to, I have to bring this stuff. You gotta, you gotta, you gotta show this stuff for people to wrap their head around how terrible this stuff is. Okay. Deadpool's newest romance established an important distinction. The foul mouthed mercenary Deadpool is mostly known for his constant wit and fourth wall breaks. He has found success in his violent ventures, but the same cannot be said for his forays into romance. Deadpool has certainly had his moments, but has only led to heartbreak and an endless list of ex wives. However, his newest venture may give him another shot at true love. Is this romance comics we're talking about here? We're talking about the mercenary, uh, the psycho, crazy mercenary Deadpool. Uh, okay. All right, let's get into it. Deadpool number three. Uh-oh, I've got some kind of new new update from Comicsology. We're going under. Everybody's been laid off. No. I think Comicsology will survive, but uh, I mean the app's going to be there. But yeah, they're 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 cutting. They're definitely cutting. I guess Comicsology, the Comicsology, Comicsology, which was purchased by Amazon years ago, um, is facing big cuts because Amazon is cutting, um, laying off. Google is too. They're laying off thousands and thousands of people, and people are like, "Oh my God, what do you think was going to happen?" You push this, you push nonsense, and eventually it's not going to, it's going to, eventually it's going to break your bottom line. I, I got news for you. And then you get laid off, and then they cry victim. Who could have seen that coming? Really? Let me get a drink before I get into this. I wade, I wade into this crap. Wade, Wade will get it. Ha ha. Yeah. <laughs> Unbelievable, man. We're going to see if this uh, comic book deserves the slap of shame here. Uh, oh, boy. I'm not going to read this whole comic book. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that to you. And I'm, I'm definitely not going to do it to myself. we got uh, Lord Deathstrike here talking to Lady Deathstrike. At, where are they? They're at the outside cafe. Of course they are. Where else would you start a comic book? These people go, the, these, these characters in today's modern comic books keep, that's all they ever do is go to cafes <sighs> or diners. I've been, I've been harping on this for a while, but I guess they're talking about a contract that the lady that strikes going to try to kill Deadpool or almost said Deathstroke. Deadpool. So here we are. Um, here we are with Deadpool. Um, oops, I didn't mean to do that. Let's go back one. A little bit of technical difficulties. I do this. Uh, I just record this unedited, raw. You know, I'm gonna I'm gonna make mistakes here. So that's the way I like to do it. Clunk, and you've got <laughs> you've got two eggs that are circle like eyeballs and a bacon smiley. You know, mouth here. You made me eggs. As Deadpool wakes up on a on a couch or or a table or whatever he's on here. You're not allergic, are you? I hope I hope not, because that's the only thing I have left in my fridge. Pretty sure they're about to go bad too. Valentine Vuong. Wow. They put wow here. So I don't know who Valentine Vuong is. Vuong is. But they're they're pushing. Wow, who does this? <laughs> Jim Shooter would have read one page of this and thrown it away. He would he would have gotten his lighter out and just lit it on fire right there. Good God! Oh, don't worry. Oh, don't worry. That wouldn't have stopped me. I've eaten a lot of questionable things. Hey, are those eggs supposed to be me? You can tell I'm not much of an artist. Are you kidding? It's a dead ringer. I'd have this frame, but I'm also really tasty. 
I can't. I, it's hard to read this stuff. I mean, it, it's it's a it, this stuff doesn't roll off the tongue. Let's put it this way. Whew, and that's being kind. I can't remember the last time someone made me eggs or me eggs. You're spoiling me with all this domesticity. I have to ask though. Does Deadpool talk like that? I don't know. How long until you're at? Atlier buddies come busting through that door. I don't even know what that is. They usually come in through the windows. Oh, well, that makes a world of difference. You know how expensive it is to replace a window, doors and hinges, and you don't have to buy a new one. Doors have hinges, and you don't have to buy a new one every time you go through them. <sighs> but to answer your question, I'm not expecting any other guests. I wanted to have a nice, quiet breakfast with just the two of us. Not to be super rude, but like, why? Because I think you're cute. <laughs> what? What? Me? Why? Why not? So many reasons why not. My rapid live. Oh my God, there are so many of them. And he opens up his chest and shows the tumors on his liver. Yeah, my ribs, that thing got way bigger overnight. Is this a Rena's me situation? I don't even know what that is. All right, whatever. Okay. Man of the hour, see what everyone's saying about the world's most eligible bachelor. Are you high, Wolverine? We couldn't print this quote. Did you know that Mystique once described me as more red flags than a relationship subreddit? And that was a compliment. Besides, have you seen what I look like under this mask? Honestly, I was a bit preoccupied by your rapid liver growth. My rap oh, I read it out of order. I'm sorry, I read it at my rapid liver. Oh, God, there's so many of them. Anyway, next page. I don't know what this is. Uh, I think we need a blurb or pull quote here. Dr. Octopus, um, four high-tech tentacles, and none of them can give him a better haircut. She's pretty upset. Maybe she broke a nail. Valentine's Vong, the actual reason my chest is bursting, not the carnage freak under my skin. Alyssa Wong, writer. Yeah, I think we're getting to the root of the problem there. Alyssa Wong is the writer. Don't know much about her. Uh, not impressed so far. This might be the first thing I've read from, from old Alyssa Wong. Uh, do I even want to go any further here? It looks like Dr. Octavius is in, once again, they're in a goddamn diner. They're, they're in a, they're in another cafe or a restaurant or a diner. They always start the scenes out the same perspective side view and they're sitting in a diner. What the fuck is going on? What? I mean, what the hell is this about? I don't get it. Oh. Okay, let's get back on. Why is this menu 17 pages long? You tell me, Harrower. You picked the restaurant, Otto Octavius, a.k.a. Dr. Octopus. It was literally the first place we saw on the street. And your point is... Dude, check out the crappy Doc Ock cosplay. I swear, if he doesn't stop jostling us. I wanted to go somewhere nice, but you said, Hey, watch those tentacles, man. Oh? These tentacles? And he destroys the, the table of the people sitting next to him. And this guy tries to punch him, and then he stops. He catches his hand. 
or some the the lady does. I don't even know who. I don't even know who he's sitting with. Some kind of mutant villain or something. And then they go back and they clink their glasses and they go back to their little side perspective of them sitting in the booth at the restaurant again. This is unbelievable. Now I remember why they picked this place. Bottomless mon- mimosas. How are you planning to find Deadpool and your escape and your escape symbiote? I told you, Otto, it's not your standard carnage. I tweaked it, made it better. Now it's like Carnage 2.0. What, did you give it GPS and Bluetooth? Oh, sure, I strapped a little smartwatch on it in utero. Of course not. I gave it a biological urge, a homing instinct. It doesn't just want to come back to me, it needs to. And the bigger the symbiote grows, the more urgent the instinct becomes. So I guess there's a symbiote growing in Deadpool's chest. But all we see are these guys sitting at the restaurant. So they go to the Metropolitan Zoo here. It looks like Deadpool and this Valentine character. Ooh, look at Leia the lion's little face. We have to go see her. I heard the snow leopard just had cubs. So we should check those out too. I thought you'd pick somewhere less crowded for a field test, Valentine. It's important to see how the symbiote functions in a real-world setting. You're going to be walking through crowds of people, so we should see how your symbiote reacts to various external stimuli, proximity to humans, animals, audio, and olfactory triggers. I want to establish a baseline of behavior so we can adjust from there. You mean you want to know if the symbiote plays nice? Or has an unbearable craving for children nuggets. <laughs> Guilty. <sighs> Modern comic books, ladies and gentlemen. Mo- Modern Marvel comic books. And I just wanted to go on a cute zoo date with you. Handy dandy zoo tips. Give the animals their space. Keep your an eye on your little ones. Be prepared. Cute. Oof. This word again. No one ever thought I was cute. Even as a kid, I was a hideous child. What am I supposed to do with this? Deadpool? Yes. I said, don't forget that your backpack is full of drugs. Drugs? And none for you, Gretchen Wieners. There's enough sedative anesthetic in there to keep the symbiote calm for hours. Now, come on, Leah. Come on, Leah the lion awaits. I can't even read this stuff. I mean... And they're holding hands. Hey, let's go back one. Cute. He's still... He's still trying to get over this cute uh, label that she put on him. Or he, she, whatever, whatever the hell. They're holding hands here in the zoo. And then they're taking pictures with the alligators and the ostriches. And I guess Carnage comes out of his body and tries to eat one of the ostriches or something. I can't make heads or tails of this crap. Uh, someday you'll have to tell me why you hate elephants so much. They just, uh, get under my skin, so to speak. Hey there, little guy. How's it going? Uh, I thought I deleted that pic before sending it, but I'll have, you know, I'm not that little. Oh, you mean Carnage Jr., not Wade Jr. Good boy. The Carnage comes out and eats popcorn. You can't just say things like that. That's... That's not that's not fair. Do you have any idea what it mean does to me? Oh, I'm starting to get an inkling. I I don't know. Uh I hit the wrong I think I hit the wrong button here. There we go. I wanted to go full screen for this uh epic uh this epic tale. You're so beautiful, so good. They're giraffes, Harrower. 
They're long, smelly, endangered deer with upsetting tongues. That's hardly interesting. So Dr. Octavius and this horror chick, villain chick, have gone to the zoo as well. <laughs> uh, don't listen to him. Each one of you is magnificent and special as she's talking to the giraffes. I'm going to give you a gift. You're about to become even more special. And it looks like she's mutating. She's mutating the giraffes. So it so happens that Lady Deathstrike looks like she's at the zoo today as well. What's that sound? What the hell is that? Oh, I hate bugs. Well, I don't know if they're at the zoo. I can't keep up with the story. Uh, yes, you are very scary. Yes, you are. Are you experiencing any pain, Wade? Any unpleasant sensation or feedback? Oh, no, I'm just dandy. Thanks for asking. I'm not like, it's not like I'm starring on one episode of Monsters Inside Me and everyone keeps talking to my parasite like I'm not even there, like I'm not even here. Are you jealous? Me? Jealous of remnancy? I don't, I don't even know what that is. Why should I be jealous of? No. Remember the reason I'm just questioning is so we can learn enough about your symbiote to remove it safely. Or maybe you two can come to some kind of agreement. Wouldn't it be useful to have your very own symbiote? They make a good point. What do you have to say for yourself? They make a good point. They, is that her pronouns? They, cause she's non, is she binary or non-binary or gender fluid so now the pronouns are they I, what is this i mean good god what how do you get a job at marvel comics how the hell do you hire this person at marvel comics marvel comics Kiss? I missed it. I, I, I don't know. Kiss? Absolutely not. Didn't think I had many lines left to draw, but I'm drawing one on lip locking my own liver god. My own liver goo. Sorry. Not me, stupid papa. You know what? I've changed my mind. You are on the level. Hey, Valentine, you have something on your face. I do? Yes. No, actually, no, actually, but you're about to as Deadpool goes in for a kiss. And then it's interrupted by these mutant giraffes that attack. And the little carnage symbryo goes, no. Watch out, giraffe crossing. Excuse me, you're interrupting something very important. Do you know if giraffes are endangered? I guess that's the name. Renamus me? Renee's me? That's the name that he calls the carnage symbiote? Awesome. Neither do I. Making it rain, baby. I know you're here, Harrower. The giant mutated giraffe was kind of a dead giveaway. Valentine's breakfast, friends. Reheat the oven to 75 degrees. This is an actual, this is an actual published Marvel comic book. And this is, then you see Doc Ock and this horror come up with this uh, big mutated Venus flytrap. I guess she can mutate things. I've never, I've never heard of this character, nor do I give two shits to continue knowing anything about this character. You didn't like my present? Next time, I'll just send flowers to be continued in Deadpool number four. This is a modern Marvel comic book. A Deadpool comic book. Deadpool. Giant, hundreds of millions of dollars of merchandising. Uh, Ryan Reynolds movie. This is, this is who they're allowing to write Deadpool in modern Marvel comic books. This is... This is unbelievable to me. I, I know, I know maybe I'm making a bigger deal. Somebody, ah, just get over it. Don't read it if you don't like it. But I'm sorry. This is, this is, 
indicative of modern comic books. I didn't know it was this bad. I, there are a few modern comic books, current comic books that I read. I don't buy them, but you know, I read them on the digital. I subscribe to the digital app, Marvel Unlimited, and I'll read it. The new Venom. The new Venom, David Michelini, I think I'm pronouncing his name right. Um, you know, classic writer from, you know, late 70s, 80s, uh, Marvel. Uh, he's writing Venom. That's good. I, I like that. Um, there, there's a Star Wars Bounty Hunters title, title out that I like. But look what look at this stuff has been hijacked by these fucking weirdos, man. This is absolute nonsensical. This is written, this is like written, this takes me back to like fifth grade where we, we were forced to write, every Friday we had to write a little story and stand up in front of the class and read it. And we just tried to make it as silly as possible and make girls laugh. That's what this reminds me of. My, but the, the stuff in fifth grade was better, better than this stuff. Anyway, okay. Anyway, oh man, it, it pains me. I, it, that was, a, that was a hard read. Um, that was a, definitely a hard read to be continued in Deadpool four. I'm on the edge of my seat here. I want to see more. I want to see more restaurant and diner scenes and zoo visits, you know, and then just terrible dialogue, terrible plot, terrible dialogue. You know, the art can't even make up for it. What, would John Byrne write something like, or would John Byrne draw something? If he got this, if he got this from a Marvel writer, you think he would put pen to paper on this? He would get them on the phone and go, are you crazy? You think I'm putting my name anywhere near something, this garbage? Yeah, this is, uh, this is the, this is definitely the slap of shame. I don't know. Anyway, that's that's gonna wrap up the episode for today. I, I just can't take any more. Uh, you know, this is gonna be a weekly show. Um, you know, I'll be uh, uploading it to YouTube. Um, you know, Sunday night, late Sunday nights, uh, early Monday will be available to watch on my channel. Uh, sorry to put anybody through that, but I just had to. I I didn't realize it was this bad. Call me naive, uh, delusional, whatever, but. I'm just starting to grasp about how terrible this stuff is. And, and I just thought I would, I have to, I have to do something to, uh, to kind of, uh, voice my concerns and, uh, and kind of bring this stuff, um, up. I mean, I know plenty of people are doing this, but you know, I, I just can't hold my tongue anymore. I had to, uh, I had to kind of see for myself and, uh, oh man, it's bad. So. Anyway, um, I appreciate you tuning in. Um, the, I do have an audio version. If you want to put yourself through that uh, on Spotify as well. And uh, yeah, I'm going to sign out. And until next time, uh, take care. And go read some good classic comic books from the Bronze Age. When comic books didn't suck. I will talk to you later.